Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, so as I said, I'm glad everyone's nicely relaxed because this is gamification of threat modeling, um, which is both an introduction to a project, an almost project called Cornucopia, and a tool that someone hiding at this point, but he is in this room somewhere, uh, is, uh, is responsible for. So uh, let's see if I can figure out how to make this work. There we go. So threat modeling. Um, it is in one of the US executive orders that one 14028 that threat modeling is something that should be part of the basic requirements for applications that are of any consequence. And I really hope that the same thing will be in our UK government guidelines. Um, and it's also in the OS top 10 for 2021 in insecure design. Uh, there will be links to the back at some point. So traditional threat modeling is usually done with something called stride. If you do threat modeling, if you've done any threat modeling, you'll know stride and you'll know that a friend of mine, uh, Adam Shostak, who's also very much involved with OWASP and also very much involved with threat modeling, has done a lot around stride and done a lot around gamification using stride. Um, at a very high level, it's these things, right? It's spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. The gamification version uh, for stride that Adam created is called elevation of privilege after that final step in the process. Uh, this is what old school development practices look like. And it's a very waterfall stage. And you get an opportunity to do something about design in the space called design. Um, in these cases, or when you're building infrastructure, then stride is an appropriate way to work. So it's, it's an appropriate way of looking at the world. Um, this is the point where you get to determine what the security requirements should be, and where you get to design how you're going to deal with those security requirements. What does that look like? This is the agile development process. And in the agile development process, we get an opportunity here to think about what it is we're going to be doing. So as part of planning, and as we move into coding, we get to think about how we're going to create this thing that we're creating. We also get an opportunity to think about it once we move into operate, because we're gonna create something now, we're gonna start working on it, start operating in it, and then we're going to put new requirements back in. Uh, and then we get to do it in testing as well, because we are probably testing before we release as part of a quick agile development framework or agile dev cycle. So at that point, we also get some requirements for, hey, we've discovered these test issues. In fact, you get to do it everywhere during Agile. The problem with doing it everywhere, though, is how do you do it everywhere? So the four questions, this is, this is Adam's uh, quick way to do threat model, right? If you ask these four questions, what are we working on? What could go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And then did we do a, for, a good job? So it's basically the plan, do, check, act cycle. It's what are we going to do and how are we going to deal with it? When do we do threat modeling? Well, the problem with threat modeling is it's about time. That's primarily the big concern with threat modeling. It's all about time, right? It takes time. It happens at design time. We're generally modeling too late. We're doing this after the designs are finalized. If we're working with agile development teams, we're probably only looking at designs when they've already pushed out the first release to production because that's only two weeks that they've been working on something. So we're probably modeling too late or we're modeling on things that aren't accurate. So this is from Avi and Steven, who are part of the OWASP threat modeling project. Avi, who's on the board with me as well. Threat modeling, the sooner the better, but never too late. It's, it's a great quote, right? It, it's truly exactly right. The problem is threat modeling also takes too much time, traditionally, the way in which we threat model. Um, if you take a large piece of design, it takes a lot of time to think about all the things that can go wrong. And it takes even more time to figure out how you're going to deal with all those things that can go wrong. So too much time, model too late. You probably want to find too many threats rather than too few. Adam Shostak. This one is a bit contentious because he and I argue about this all the time. Too many threats means we never get around to actually releasing to production. If we don't release to production, then I can't order my Justy takeaway. And I'm very upset. Sharif's not happy because he doesn't have a job anymore because he spent all the time threat modeling and the business has gone bankrupt. So that's not how threat modeling needs to work. You don't want to find too many. You want to find just the, just the amount that you're working on right now. 
we also end up with inaccurate models because things change over time, especially with agile development, right? This week, we've got something in production. Two weeks from now, the things that are in production are completely different. We might even move to a new stack. We don't know. So many things change so quickly. We end up with models that are either modeled too late or they're modeled on something that was designed originally when we thought it was going to production and what we designed the threat model around doesn't match what's actually running. George Box, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Question is, is the model good enough for this particular application? So we need a good enough model that is created using the time that we have and that is done as early as possible in the development process. Early as possible, the best place from my perspective to do this is when we're doing story scrubbing or backlog grooming. It's when we're talking about what the stories are gonna entail. It's the point at which developers are discussing what they're gonna do for uh, how reliable the system needs to be, uh, how uh, scalable does this particular functionality need to be. All the non-functionals are already being discussed there anyway. If we do it at story scrubbing or backlog grooming, it's already a time box exercise, right? It's already something that they're doing, as I said, they're already doing non-functional requirements and the acceptance criteria. So this is the perfect time to talk about the security requirements they're gonna have there. And we stop when we have just enough, close enough a model to actually write this piece of code and release it to production. It's the same as what we do with the functionals, the same as what we do with the rest of the non-functionals. So gamification is threat modeling with cornucopia and elevation of privilege. As I said, these are two incredibly popular approaches. We use EOP, uh, despite the fact that earlier I said EOP is old school way of doing things. It's still how we threat model things like SAP installations. I have customers that have that, uh, lots of that. I'm sure you guys all know of SAP installations around the world. Um, or when we're talking about systems that just don't, don't lend themselves to the same agile development process. Um, there is an online platform now, which I think my next slide talks about in more detail. I have no idea because I'm now flying completely blind, seeing exactly what you see there. Um, so this is Cornucopia. Um, there are a bunch of threat modeling tools out there that you can make use of. Um, the one that I got involved with quite early is Cornucopia. And the reason I got involved with it is because firstly, it's a game. And one of the things that you need to know about me is that I really enjoy playing games which is why I'm glad we all had a drink before coming down here. Um, and secondly, it, it leverages really great projects, some of which Spiros has already mentioned, the SVS, OCP, AppSensor, SafeCode or KPIC, which are not OSVS, uh, sorry, not uh, OWASP, but still great projects it leverages. Um, so it leverages those to talk about the details around threats. And it, it provides you with a gameplay style approach to actually working through them. The inputs for Cornucopia or to play the game is some designs, some data flow diagrams maybe. Those are less important than you would imagine. Uh, mostly because the architectural design that you ask as a security architect for, or if you're a part of the team that's doing this, when you ask for an architectural design, they probably created one to show to an auditor last year. Maybe, if that happens to be the application the auditor looked at. Um, or they did create it as part of a bigger design process, but it definitely doesn't match what they're doing today. It probably doesn't match anything, look anything like what's in production. Don't worry, good news, you'll help to update those as you go through the process. Data flow diagrams is exactly the same thing. Things change all the time. What you really do need though is the people who are gonna be building the solution and who understand how the solution is gonna work. So you need to get as many people in that dev team as you can involved in the process. And it's important to note that it's the people in the dev team they're going to be doing this. The outputs of Cornucopia, well, that on the right-hand side there is the score sheet. It's a game, right? We have to score. People have to win. Uh, but it's not just a score sheet. It's also, you can see there that there are six colored blocks on the left-hand side of that thing, more, left, more than the left half. Each of those six colored blocks represents decks or uh, uh, suits that I'll show you now. Um, but in there, there's a space to write down what we talked about when we said this threat was possible. The output is also going to be some acceptance criteria for the stories that you're going to be working on in that sprint. 
it's going to be either uh, when a user clicks on this, they can do that. And we will make sure that this can't happen or that these fields are properly protected or whatever that might be, some acceptance criteria that we can then test against later. Or there's gonna be a new story. There might be security stories that are added. It's rare, but there are some that, okay, we're gonna have to create a new story that allows us to run this on HTTPS because I don't know why we thought we we're gonna run it on HTTP. It happens. But also, as I said earlier, you'll get updated versions of those diagrams because you put whatever you have up there or you'll have a whiteboard where you'll be describing broadly what we're talking about. And as you find threats, you'll be adding things in, you'll be adding, oh wait, there's this new piece we added. Oh, we have this other data connection that we have coming in here. Oh, and this is, there's this API that we've created that was specifically for this one customer. We need to add that in. So those diagrams will get more accurate. Uh, score sheet, there's a bunch of links everywhere. This presentation links all will be available to you, but the score sheet is available as a download. Feel free to use it. But the real outcomes of playing a game of Cornucopia is that you'll see more accurate design documents and you'll see stories that make sense from a security point of view. You'll also see developers who understand what can go wrong with the thing they're about to build. And that is absolutely critical because if they understand what can go wrong and why it can go wrong, they're gonna make sure it doesn't because they don't wanna be the guy who wrote the code that does this thing that they shouldn't be doing. The card decks, which I'll go through very quickly. Uh, identity, so authentication, uh, anywhere where we have to identify who you are. Authorization, which is all about access control. So what you're allowed to do. Session management, which in web app world, which is where Cornucopia originally comes from, is specifically around sessions. Um, but it, it is also really just the period of time between us checking that auth C and auth Z in the previous two slides, how regularly do we do that? Uh, if you do it on everything the user does, it'll annoy the user and they won't buy their takeaway. If you do it on, uh, I, I don't know, never, uh, then that's probably bad too. Although not so bad if you just eat because it's on a phone and there's lots of good ways you can get around that. So it's safer. Data validation encoding, this is the big one. And this is all about trust boundaries. So where do we, where do we trust data coming in from and where do we push data out in a trusted way? Cryptography, which is encryption, hashing, and obfusc obfuscation. I even struggle to say the word because obfuscation is not cryptography, but it is covered in the same area as those questions in the deck because it is, we're talking to devs about how they're hiding stuff. They obfuscate it, they consider it hidden. And then there's the cornucopia deck itself, which is kind of like a Trump deck. It deals with all the things that aren't anywhere else. And it tends to also be uh, the way in which you can probably play to win. How to play cornucopia? Nine steps, quite easy. You take a deck of cards, which I will now show you. I have a deck here. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I have just sent out the last four. Just note to my business partners. I sent out the last four of these decks, so I don't have any in the country at the moment, um, except for this one, which Sam has kindly donated. Um, this one is Sam's that he uses regularly, I hope, with dev teams. Um, and you can see that the decks look kind of like this. They are literally just a deck of cards. Oops, I nearly completely messed up the decks. Thanks. Literally are just a deck of cards where there is a nice little pamphlet explaining these nine steps and how to win, kind of important. And uh, the decks are all just labeled as OWASP on the back. On the front, you have each of those suits and it's ace through king or two through ace technically on each of them, aces are high. And each of these, each of these cards describes a particular attack. There are a couple of wild cards, aces are wild cards in every suit and there are two jokers. Jokers, really hard to play. First time you play this game with teams, I suggest taking out the jokers because they're very interesting. Um, these are the ones that you want to play when the teams become quite cocky and they know how to play everything. And, and the aces uh, probably take them out too because they start with, you haven't invented a new type of attack. While they're learning how attacks work, it's probably best to keep those off the, off the table. But deck of cards, just like that, and you literally sit around a table playing. Grab a boardroom somewhere, preferably enough chairs for everyone, and sit down and play. 
Obviously, that doesn't work in every scenario, but I have a solution for that too, which I'll show you just now. Actually. Cool. So you take the deck, sort out the things that you want. There are those different, those six different suits. Not all suits, not all cards, as I said, you're going to possibly remove some of the cards from there. And not all the suits are necessarily valid for every game you're playing. We're building a feature that has nothing to do with input validation. Pull that from the deck. We've got a feature that's unauthenticated. Pull that from the deck. You don't need to worry about playing those cards. Deal the cards out. Everyone in the team, everyone who's playing gets an equal number of cards. You want to get through as many cards as you possibly can. And you want to give everyone as many cards as they can to play with. Then you play a card. Someone has to go first. I generally like to say the person with the biggest beard, unless Toby's in the room. Um, but go by who's been in the team the longest or who's been there the least amount of time or the person who's currently on call for the product that you're going to be threat modeling or maybe the person who last broke the build. All great ways to start a game. There is actually a game that I generally play uh, on my phone. It's, a, it's, a, it's called Shibarbi. I'll have to show you if you follow me on Twitter or something. But it basically allows a bunch of people to do something very unsanitary in this post-COVID world, which is all put their fingers on the same screen. And then it will select a finger at random to be the person who plays first. Um, yeah, the world has changed a lot since I've played around a boardroom table. You then take the card and you read, you read what's on the card. And the card will be something like, uh, Bob has found a way to bypass input validation because X, Y, Z. Now there's a lot of words in there that devs aren't gonna be familiar with initially. And that's why all those references are important. So those pointers out to things like the ASVS, pointers out to uh, the sewer coding standards, because then they can see more details about them. The person who plays the card then tries to convince everyone this attack is possible in this piece of solution that we're currently building. And this is why. And then everybody else can argue with them and say, no, it's not possible because of whatever reasons. If they can't convince the team that this is a valid attack. Then it's up to the, the person who's taking score, usually to the scrum master or maybe the product owner if they're in their room, if they're in the room, will decide, yes, this card scores or it doesn't. Generally, it's pretty easy to convince other devs as a dev that I can make this thing break. You then score that person a point for a valid attack. And whatever the card is goes on top of the pile. The next person in a clockwise or anti-clockwise or however you want to shuffle the, the play around then goes next. They will then try and play a card in the same suit, but a higher card, a more difficult attack. Because at the end of the entire round, the person who plays the highest card in that initial suit is going to win a bonus point as long as their card scored. So everyone scores a point. At the end, you see what the highest card was. That card scores an additional point. Um, the person who has the most points wins. It's a game, right? There should be a prize. If you're playing this with your teams and you're not doing prizes, you're missing a trick. Because prizes can be really, 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 really simple. Like uh, you get this shiny badge that you get to wear. Or you don't have to deal with any build problems for the next week. Or during the sprint cycle, you are immune from having to touch the build or any of the, the resulting code in production. Whatever it might be. Some... Product owners like to bribe people with cake, pizza, both work equally well. There should be an award, right? So somebody who's won should get a reward for winning. And then there should be a follow-up. All of those things that we've written down, all of those scores that we put on that score sheet, those need to become backlog stories and they need to become items that we need to work on or updates to existing stories before we start to work on them. That's the entire game the clicker there is a video playthrough i suppose i could try and play it now I, I literally never had this successfully play audio because i think i've only ever played this video on zoom calls and it didn't work let's find out huh no okay um more linkage. Uh, there is a link at the top there that is the actual YouTube video. Feel free to go check it out. Uh, this was done with uh, one of our clients. They uh, realized they couldn't scale me quite as massively as they wanted to. There were hundreds of teams that needed to be go through this process. 
Um, and the bottom is a bunch of videos that talks about each of those, uh, each of the, the suits, describing how you can teach devs about what's going in there. So there's a bit of material curated there for you. The client I was talking about is RBI. The reason I mentioned them here uh, is firstly, the name's changed, so uh, they can't come and find me. Secondly, because they're awesome. They really are awesome. They spend a lot of time and money teaching devs how to do this and putting together some really nice videos that they've donated back to the community. Um, but they are a, a, a company here in London. Um, you can see some details about who they are, part of Relics, uh, 15,000 employees, so 1,500 developers. I couldn't teach 1,500 developers because that meant flying me all over Europe to do that. Um, as much fun as that would have been pre-pandemic, it wouldn't have been great to do it through the pandemic. But because they're solving some data problems and they want these teams to continue working the way they are, and because they've essentially acquired these smart people by acquiring small companies that work in a very agile way, them being this large company in a very regulated industry um, had to find a way to do things like threat modeling in a way that worked for those dev teams without breaking how the dev teams deliver. And this is what they did. It's exactly how it worked. This is the CISO at ReBusiness, um, Cornucopia empowers engineers to move fast more securely. He is very keen on what we're doing with Cornucopia. And he's not the only one. Um, I should probably update the slides to talk about some other plastic brick manufacturers that we're working with in Denmark, who, uh, who are also doing a lot of threat modeling with us because it works doing, using the tools for this. Um, so how do you make it work? Well, you start by using the decks, uh, if you can get hold of a deck. Um, they're awesome. Uh, tabletop gaming is fantastic um, when we're in person, but it's not always doable. So there's some options I'll show you just now. Um, change up the game. Not all the features are required. Not all of them are gonna hit all the areas. So you know, make sure that you use the ones that are necessary. And then use the systems that you have available. We work in a remote working world. As long as you can communicate with a team about the attack, the threat that you have, there's a way that we can do conversations like that, right? So a lot of video conferences still work. Um, some project milestones. Uh, this went from being a Word document uh, created way back when, uh, which required someone to print and cut out cards uh, to hand out to people, not sustainable, to uh, being fully automated where uh, you make changes to a YAML file, which defines the language of the cards. And then you push out to Word or whatever format you want, or you push it out to InDesign files and you take it to your local printer and you say, please print me this InDesign file as a deck of cards and they can do it for you. Um, that's how I got the 150 or so that I ended up handing out to people. Um, or you can get hold of them through OWASP. Um, I am going to be at DEF CON this year, hopefully, because the remaining stock of the OS DEX cards are sitting in a storage locker in the US, and I will be going there with an empty uh, checked luggage bag, and I'll be bringing it back full. So September, Sam, yeah. the September meetup, if you're back here, I will have DEX cards for everyone. You get a deck, and you get a deck, and I'll go whole row for a whole suitcase. <laughs> Uh, as many as I can pack and still be under the whatever the weight limit is that I'm allowed to bring back. Um, but we also made an app because as much fun as it is sitting around a table playing games together, and it really is fun, um, having people jump up and scribble on the board and run around the table and chase each other because they're really annoyed that you've just played a king when they had the queen down on the table and they thought they had this round. In the it's really fun. It is, can be a lot of fun especially when I can close the door and lock the rest of the organization out for three hours while we do this, the dev teams love it. But we don't live in a world where everybody can get in a room together. This is unusual. I'm very, very glad that we're doing this tonight. So we have a, ver a version to do this online, which I hope, no, not yet. Is there, I think what I might have to do is demo it. Do I dare demo? It went okay for Spiros. I'm sure it'll be fine. So I'll show you what it looks like, the digital version. Um, next steps, uh, more languages, uh, because this is a game that needs to be played in language. You're describing things in languages. 
we have a bunch of translations, but not enough. If you speak a language that isn't in the list and you want to contribute to the project, please do. It's right there. That's the project repository, uh, the project page itself. So all the details on what you can do, and where, where, where you can get Deca cards, which I'm gonna have to update because I don't have any cards left, um, or uh, where the repository is, if you wanna make contributions to the project, it's right there. It's just a YAML file, just translate the lines in the YAML file and you've got a new translation. Uh, and use Copy. Copy is the digital version of Cornucopia. It's free to use, completely tracker free. It is, it is awesome. And if you have like tracker uh, checking software on your browser, Sam, if you do, you'll see that there's nothing popping up despite some desires to have things like that. Um, and that's the project next steps. So let me go to, I suppose, briefly, this is secure delivery, Sam mentioned this earlier. Uh, we do this a lot at scale. So if you're keen to, to chat to us about what we do, please feel free to. Um, these are some links, uh, including the video playthrough, uh, some threat modeling in a minute uh, slides and presentations, videos. Um, and then I'm going to escape out of here. Sure. Oh, right there, the bottom. Copy.securedelivery.io. I'm going to open that up now in a browser tab. So, so, so the, the reason that that, that weird beta gentleman is asking this, he, I bet him that he couldn't build me a digital version of the, the card deck in a weekend. Um, this is the first time we've seen each other in person since then, so I suspect I'm buying dinner tonight. Okay. Also, Erlang, like why? Like I couldn't even help him on the project because who writes in Erlang? Well, Toby and like three other people on the planet. Uh, I'm gonna take the caps lock off. Well, I suppose it doesn't really matter. Yeah, so everyone has their phone in their hands. <laughs> what could go wrong? Everyone has a phone. Yeah, so you'll, you go to the website, you can see. <laughs> so, so it does work on phones, but you are going to mess up because you're going to be sliding things around with your fingers and it, the, the UI isn't great on a phone. <laughs> Or you can pull a, uh, raise a pull request for the, yeah. So uh, it briefly goes into you can how, how, let's, you know, how to play, but enough about it already. So let's give it a friendly name. We're going to call it OWASP London. Uh, what are we? May? May 22. Um, you can see here that there's the option to choose between cornucopia and elevation of privilege. Uh, the decks are identical um, in the sense that they are from a <laughs> from a, a playability point of view work the same way. Um, so you can choose to play elevation of privilege using the same site. Um, I'm going to show you cornucopia. Create the game. And if you all grab that URI, this is, this, is, this is why I'm less worried about people actually joining the game. If you all grab that URI, you can then click on join game as player. Um, you'll notice that the, the application doesn't have any login. QR code would be a great idea. There you go. Okay. You can scan the URL. Yeah. Okay, from here. I don't think that's what, what do you, what do you want me to do here, Shavi? Click join game and then open a new tab. Oh, okay. 
So just turn the thing around and take it. How do I do that? You do open this up. Yeah, that's the one. There's a charcoal generator popped in. Take it in your arm and paste it. Okay. Scan the thing on the right. This is really going to go well. I'm, I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. I, I do want to point out this is Sam's computer. So if that 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 URL that he took us to, if that actually is malware, you know, you, how well do you know Sam? Click on the link at your peril. I like you. Do you, do you work in the industry maybe? I don't have any, I don't have a game page open anymore. <laughs> Click back. <laughs> I want to open it in a new tab though. Yay. There we go. Go down, go down, go down. Yes, everyone. Hello, everyone. Ooh, there's lots and lots and lots of people. Ooh, script alerts. Hi. Nice try. <laughs> Okay, so everyone's going to get less than one card at this point. All right, if you're in, you're in. Otherwise, cool. So, I have no, oh, this is the, hang on. So, in the gameplay, oh, somebody's already played. They're in my cards. You can see them. You don't generally show your cards to people, right? So everyone got at least four cards. That's great. So if you're if you're the security guy in the room or girl in the room, you're going to be on this page watching the game because you want them to play. You don't want to be playing yourself. The way this game works is the person who has the least self-control plays first. <laughs> As you can see, once your card has been shuffled up off your off your hand and onto the table. The card is played. Everyone can now see your card. You can't pull it back. That feature isn't in the game. Um, you're then supposed to talk about what the card says. And this is Ryan can influence or alter authorization controls and permissions and can therefore and can therefore bypass them. So so as a player, you will have a thumbs up. So you can do that and give Sam a thumbs up. Or you can do that and say, actually, no, you know what? I don't think Sam deserves a thumbs up. No, I think that's just the screen because it's, it's, it's going on pretty quickly here. The problem with having such a large game is that that card won't score until he gets at least half the people to vote for him. Yeah, four more people, three more people. Come on, if you've got this thing open, click on it. One more, ah, no, who, who decided to take theirs all? There we go, and you can see it scored. Um, if I go to the actual game, the following game, I can see here, Sam has got a point on the score. So there is a screen for people who are just watching the game. They can enjoy the excitement, not get to see anybody's hands. There is a screen for each player who has their cards in their hand, and they can shuffle cards up. I love the fact that I actually got the, uh, the Ace of Cornucopia. I mean, that is pure luck. But assuming it would score, and it would, the game will then pick you know, the, the card that's the highest, that's in the correct suit. Uh, following the rules of the game, it'll then determine whether that card has successfully taken the end of round score as well. So you can not worry about the scoring and just play, give thumbs up if you think the attack is valid, or no thumbs up if you think the attack is not valid, or you just don't like the person who played the card, which does happen. People, by the way, are meaner when it's not 
in person, I've noticed. <laughs> I'm, I'm very impressed that it didn't fall over. <laughs> Yes. Free, feel free to use it. Go, out, go crazy with it. Um, I do have a deck of cards here for somebody who asked me a decent question. Um, I will bring more decks of cards to the September meetup. Any questions? Yes. Hang on, we gotta, where's, where's the constable? Testing. Uh, yeah. So basic one, uh, I had also come across a particular uh, approach where uh, there's a con in agile basically the concept of abuser stories, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, for a user story which is defined for for example uh, a user can perform a particular action action. This is a use case. Yeah. So you'll find if you read through each of these cards, essentially it is an abuse story, and then you describe that abuse story in the context of your application. And there are teams that use it that way. They will actually create negative or abuse stories in their backlog, and they will write those off as specific security uh, features or security requirements. Um, I don't generally push for teams to do that. I, I like them to use the concept of an abuse story, read it like this, talk it through, how it can go wrong. But then they need to move on to how we're going to avoid that going wrong, and that should be either a new feature in the application or it should be some uh, you know, additional bit of testing or some additional piece of acceptance criteria for an existing story. So I tend to prefer that they keep their user stories in Jira just as user stories, and they use the abuse stories just as part of the conversation. But yes, these are effectively those abuse stories. They're just more generic. By the way, we are trying to create more of them. In fact, uh, one of the things that uh, Toby and I discussed was a mobile version of this, uh, because there are some very specific mobile app dev stuff that isn't covered by this. This is mainly web applications. Also, while I'm thinking of that, and while you pass that to the next person, you'll notice that there is at the bottom of the cards are those references I was talking about. You'll notice that the only references that I can actually link to and that are hot linked from here is KPEC because KPEC has a nice way of displaying their stuff on their sites. Um, I might pull this entire section out and just literally reference your project Speros, and that, like go there, just use this. Here's the link to this particular piece of, of, well, this particular user story is these references, go pick it up. There we go. You sa saved, me a lot of, saved me a lot of time though, because as you can see, you can't link to ASVS here. Um, that is something that hopefully the, the team will be doing down the line. So you can click on a direct reference to the ASVS. Just one more question. Uh, sure. They will be, they will be doing it down the line. I made sure of it. Good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, one more thing, like, uh, uh, at, um, is it to be done for uh, every fe feature? This uh, activity. So, teams tend to do this the first time with the entire thing because they've never done threat modeling before. Uh, then they tend to go very small, and they'll only do it for any new epic or any new large story, depending on what the terminology is in your organization, that they're going to be doing. And usually that's like a, a four sprint cycle because they're, they're winding down from everything to smaller thing to very small thing. Eventually they will do it for every story. If the story has some kind of security requirement, they'll go, well, we need to put this out. This piece that we're going to be doing, let's talk it through. But the teams tend to adjust that for themselves pretty quickly. Yeah, because the other thing is challenges we have to uh, this might take a time right so, yeah so, so they might be reluctant to have allocated a sufficient time for this activity okay i have an answer to that so a bit of uh, um, advice mm -hmm. from someone who's done this mm -hmm. how to motivate your developers to play okay yeah. so grant has mentioned a few things how you can motivate your Pizza. developers okay uh what i found you can motivate them with some physical gadgets, with some toys. So uh, there are Sony wireless headphones, which I offered. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I had like 20 people signing up. But then I found on Amazon, I found you can buy some a mini drone, which fits in the palm of your hand. And it costs only 50 pounds. 
you wouldn't believe the amount of develop basically the entire development department wanted to get that toy <laughs> so you can you can go cheap and still win big in motivation but but you're right it still does take time so you, you're still borrowing time from product owners to do this but as i said we do it as part of their normal dev cycles and the more familiar they become with the deck the quicker they go through it and the smaller the piece that they're dealing with the quicker they can go through the cards has been uh, delegated to the champions or yep. like, like basically rather than depending on the security always basically so security team is never in the room after the first time so you'll help them learn the game and then as the security team you step away security champions in the room sure but you actually want the dev teams the guys and girls who are going to be building the code you want them talking about it on their own yeah and it's part of their normal cycle right then they're doing it as uh, this is two weeks we're going to look that's, at stories important part like you don't want to be dependent on the security yeah we, we don't scale there, there aren't enough of us there's one of us for every hundred of them thank you uh grant uh, if you click on the tab with s on it which is slider i think there's a question there as well for you there's slider uh, one one to the left from the current green one yeah green uh, s. that one yeah there's a how long a game of chrono copy would take uh it depends on the size of the piece that you're going to be looking at it also depends on how different the language is between the person who's explaining it. Like when I showed up in Paris, my French is horrible. It took forever. Uh, when I went to the Netherlands, I speak reasonable Dutch. It went far quicker. Here in the UK, um, yeah, my English is not terrible. So that, that generally goes pretty fast. Okay, there's a question. But it, it does, it can, it, I think the longest game I've played was three days. The shortest game I've played was 20 minutes. Well, other than the one we just played now. Is the game um, targeted at specific architectures like Monolith or SPA, that kind of thing? Um, Microservices? Be because it's abuse story based uh, and more abuse cases, the architecture doesn't matter as much. The big differences in architecture, like I said, with SAP versus modern app web applications, then you probably want to look at some other ways of doing it. So looking at EOP then. But generally, if it's a web app or a mobile app, for the most part, the devs figure out how to make these abuse cases work for themselves. I'd like to have more cards. I'd like to have more abuse cases that are more specific to specific areas, but we, we've managed to do pretty much every kind of relatively modern, like going back 20 years worth of applications, it works. Yeah, I think there's another question on the screen. How do you convince developers to play this? So apart from the prizes, um, how long? Where? No, no. How do you convince? Oh, how do you convince devs to play, play this? Yeah. Um, you appeal to their darker selves. Deep down, devs all want to be hackers, um, and that may not be entirely true, but it is almost certainly very true. They all like the idea of being able to break, specifically, other people's code, um, and they know how to do it. They have a better idea of how this web app is going to fall apart than I ever will have, no matter how many times I've actually pen tested the app. Um, so yeah, appealing to their, their competitive side definitely helps. They, they, they like to win. We all do, but devs are particularly, yeah, clued up by something to win. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Yep. Just getting back to your dismissive comment about obfuscation earlier. Yes. Isn't all of cryptography just obfuscation, but by clever mathematicians? Ooh. Yes, yes. Okay. And, and quantum, quantum computing is going to make that all uh, moot anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. You could tell that which one of us is the dev and which is the security guy, right? <laughs> okay. May I remind you, whoever asks the best question, you're going to get a uh, deck of cornucopia cards. You want to show that deck again? Grant? Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Come on, Anyone questions, questions. <laughs> Uh, my question is, can I have the deck? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good question, Spiros, but no, no. <laughs> it was worth a try. It was worth a try. It was definitely worth a try. What uh, has it been updated uh, quite uh, to make it in line with the latest uh, uh, technology stack? So yeah, so uh, the mappings definitely need updating. Uh, a big chunk of the work that still needs to happen is all those mappings. And that's why I was very happy to be able to take a shortcut and use a different approach to mapping to other standards. When was the last update? Uh, last push. I think the last push was only a language change, but that was probably February or so this year. 
So the major uh, technical change hasn't been there. No, because because it basically it, the, the the things that change are going to be the standards. So the next version of ASVS would require a change to this. I think that's probably the next the next cycle point that we need to push in. Okay. But I'd like to be adding new languages or new abuse stories. So if you're playing the game and you have your cards, what card is the best to see? And you're like, oh, I'm going to win now. Uh, so you have to be able to score against this particular feature or that particular app with that attack. Uh, the most powerful attack in the deck is the Ace of Cornucopia or the Jokers if you're playing with them. Um, so if you see those cards in your hand, you know two things. One, you're going to have to come up with really great attacks because they're complicated to, to win with. But one of the, actually one of the, the, uh, the Jokers now is incredibly easy in Europe to win with. Um, should I give it away? No. Take a look at the deck. <laughs> there, there, is, there is actually a, a, a way to see all the cards. And here you can see the entire deck of cards. Uh, also, you can see all the, um, the cards that are used for elevation of privilege. But uh, one of those two, those two gold-colored cards uh, is the card you really want to have in your hand when you're playing. Because if you can't make that card win, um, either the dev team is doing something amazing, and I really want to hear that story, or you're not trying hard enough. Cool. So I just wanted to ask, uh, because it certainly is my opinion or my thought that cards are different in different countries. They don't all go two to 10 Jack Queen King. Correct. So do you make different cards for different countries or just change the language? So they don't yet have that capability, but there is no reason it couldn't have, right? Um, the, the way in which the cards are laid out now is from a Western mindset. Um, Colin, when he put it together originally, Colin Watson, who's my, my co-project lead on this, mm -hmm. who built, did all the work, most of the work, 99% of the work uh, when putting the physical deck together in Word. He it is awesome, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Really he, good. He defined it as two through ace because the two is something that's relatively easy to do. You'll notice that in twos, it's a lot of or, or, or. There's lots of scenarios that you can use to tie something together. And you'll see that the ace is literally you have to come up with something special. And the king is you have it. it it's also easy to implement versus hard to implement and uh, relatively low impact versus very high impact. So if we did it in a different language, happy for that culture to change the order in the cards, right? So just assign the two to the lower one and assign whatever that whatever that value ends up looking like. Different. Um, have you used the game while you develop the web app? Did you use the game while developing the web app, Toby? Web because, app. right? <laughs> <laughs> Toby, 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 what have you got there? So this is a SQL injection in the in the web app. <laughs> so 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 I would love to give you the deck of cards for that. Unfortunately, Toby's gonna have to get figure out how to fix it. So you're gonna have to talk to him about it. And I'll make sure I'll make sure you get a proper deck. That's brilliant. Oh, one more question. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so when you saw that the updates are happening not on a good, I mean, good rate. So uh, can't we think about like, a community uh, contribution where, where? Yeah. So it is. It is open source. If you go to the, I mean, so you're to happy to jump in. Yeah. Um, so we're about to see if Sam so has use, remained logged into GitHub. Use cases we can contribute uh, and as an addition. Oh, you're not logged in, Sam. I, I'm, I'm both impressed and disappointed. Um, so it was October last year. It was the last change. And yeah, there are the cards. So grab the language that you want to change, or you want to add things to. So Spanish, Portuguese. Yeah, I can go back and you can see that again. So Spanish, Brazilian, Portuguese, uh, French, uh, and English. So there are lots of languages I don't have. 
Um, also, I have to rely on the languages being accurate from the person who submitted the code. I don't know. So, um, but you can just change things here, right? You can just add new values, new new attacks. It's literally just text in a YAML file. And changes here will build new versions of the decks the new way. And changes here will also automatically build the online game. When we pull the YAML files across, we'll build the online game with those changes in it. Also, one uh, is, there, is there a commercial version for like in the, in the competitor? Uh, what what are the versions? So so does it complete? It is it is completely free and open source. Um, the my the COO sitting at the back of the room there is very annoyed that there is no commercial version of this application. It is free to use. Go and use it. Um, you don't need to worry about doing anything other than using it as regularly as you can. If you find it useful and you want us to help help teach devs how to do it, that's what we do. We're happy to help do that. But uh, it's it's free. There are no commercial versions. Although uh, I think Alistair's talking about integrations into Jira and how you can do things like you can have your stories immediately go to Jira and you wouldn't have to worry about the score sheet. So maybe maybe when Toby gets really bored teaching classes, he might decide to to expand it into a into a full platform. Is, is the competitor tool of threat modeling like, so, a, like a threat modeler or any other product yes uh, depend on them rather than going for a for, for this work this particular product so so there i mean i'm not trying to sell a uh, copy as a product to you right it's it's the, the the idea of threat modeling with dev teams as part of their dev cycle is what i'm really trying to go for here there are some commercial tools out there there are also some OWASP tools that provide threat modeling capabilities there are also some OWASP sponsors who provide commercial tools for threat modeling, and they all work. They're all really good tools. The problem that they have is the problems I described earlier, that it tends to be done by security people either too early before the dev teams have started building or too late after the dev teams have already finished and gone home for the day. And those tools tend to be very big bang approaches. They, they have got some value. They are useful in some cases. Um, there are lots of our clients that make use of them. But I personally think that having dev teams do it as part of dev time is more effective. Yeah, they're very, they're very security architect centric. They're very, they're, they're, they're tools that we use rather than tools that, that devs want to use. Toby never wants to touch a tool like that. He never wants to look at a tool like that. I'm going to give you these deck. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're, you are going to play, you're going to play lots of cornucopia. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much, Grant. Thank you, Sam. Right. Okay. Well, let me switch back to my presentation and uh, just say a few last words. So, uh, first of all, uh, if you're here for the first time and you have no idea how to follow us and how to find out when the next event is, uh, these are all the various ways. We have a, a web page on OWASP on the website. Follow us on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, Meetup, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn. Um, we also have a Slack, so owaspslack.com, there's a chapter London channel. If you need a Slack invitation, you can just find it, just search for OWASP Slack invitation on Google and you will find it. Okay, so I'd like to thank all the chapter supporters. Uh, and of course, very big thank you to Justin Takeaway. <laughs> Right, it is the after party time. So we're going to the pub, which is uh, just across the road. So as you exit the venue, just turn right and cross the road, you'll see this semicircle called the Viaduct Tavern. And if you're staying, I'll see you there and I'll buy you a few drinks. And can I quickly one thing? Guys, just one last thing. The, the, the OWAS training that was talked about earlier, uh, the training hasn't yet been announced. Uh, but there is something that Toby is going to be doing there as a dev with uh, some tools that are incredibly useful. Um, it's going to be uh, SOC work. So how do you do operations for dev teams? How do they deal with security operations? And the tools we're going to be using are actually MOD tools. So the uh, Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Cyber Command used for cyber rangers. So hopefully you get to play with some of those if you join that training.